Hello, hello. This is Jesse Mann. We're back. Fine art of self distancing. I'm live in New York City from the Berlin bunker. Clubs are closed down. We're in the basement of the bar Berlin. And I'm hanging out today with uh, one of my favorite singers and a great lady, Debbie Harry from Blondie. Hello. How you doing? Hi, 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 hi. What's going I, on? I love that bar, by the way. Oh, yeah. I've seen you come here when um, I think. When Miss Guy is DJ'd uh, often, you've been here a bunch for his nights. Uh, absolutely, mm. yeah. And uh, is there someone else that, that plays in your band that's done stuff here, that plays in Blondie? Is it the keyboard player or something? Oh, yeah, there? yeah. Matt Catsborn plays, uh, uh, he's played there several times. Who else? I mean, you know, it's a great place. It's a great atmosphere. I think if you go two stories up, like we're under the street right now, that like you were noticing the vaulted ceilings. But next door, it's the basement of this bar 2A that uh, folks have had since 1985. And the second floor goes up higher. You sang in there. It was like a thousand people in a little 50 person room. You sang for Bob Bruin's birthday in there one year. Yeah, we meet. that was good. But um, I don't know. I guess I'm just going to start with, you know, what's going on in the world. And I was excited to have you being such a New York person and everything that's happened everywhere. But surviving so many things if someone would have said to you like a year ago you know this was going to happen would you have believed them this this situation well you know i'm a sci-fi fan so i you know i could have said it's not beyond the realm you know anything is possible um i mean who who would have thought that you know that we would have actually you know had a career in music um you know that's that's a that's a stretch too but um no i i i would have never predicted this. I mean, um, perhaps a garbage strike or something like that. I, I could have, you know, in an off moment said, oh yeah, we're going to have a garbage strike, but no, not, not a plague. And I feel, you know, I sort of enjoy wearing the, the veil, you know, I call it a veil and I call my, um, you know, distancing seclusion because I feel it's a little bit sexier, you know? Right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my mom worked in Bloomingdale's, uh, you know, in the makeup department in the 70s. And ah. So she said Elvis walked through one time and he had like, you know, some kind of scarf thing on when he walked through Bloomingdale's and said hello, you know, checked everything out. But he was covered like that. And I remember as a kid, Kiss used to wear that when they were out. They didn't want to be seen with their makeup, so they'd have the scarf or whatever. But uh -huh. just get yeah. creative. But I was thinking when I was, you know, coming to interview you for today and everything, just that, you know, you've been in New York, I guess, in the 70s, and you survived that. And, of course, in the 80s, AIDS and 9-11 came and, and these horrible things. And, you know, but you, you know, something about you and Blondie and everything is reminds me of, like, just the power of music and people and personalities and, and the community here. And is there anything from going through those times that you can uh, impart to us, you know, from, from getting through, like, all that crap? Oh, <clears throat> Well, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, what can I say, you know, or just uh, a sense of uh, appreciating reality and, and just sort of stepping back and going, wow, whoa, you know, look, look at this. And I, I, I don't know how to, I don't have any words of wisdom. I, I, I used to think that I had words of wisdom, but now I know I'm an ignorant fool and... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, I just sort of uh, talk to my friends about it. We're all sort of, you know, thrown and can't believe that this is, is this is what's happening right now. But uh, largely, it has been predicted in sci-fi and, and film and, and, and stories all along. And, you know, one of my, you know, one of my pet peeves, of course, is, you know, our environmental issues and, um, you know, many of us feel that the reason these uh, virus, uh, viruses are living and, and developing is because of the pollutions that were, you know, were developing these pollutions that uh, <clears throat> mutate organisms and so on. Yeah, well, definitely been messing with the planet and definitely... Uh... Yeah, it's turned around. A lot of people have seen great things in nature, though. I have friends tell me that, you know, they got bears in their yard and the cattle are <laughs> closer and there's mountain lions on the streets of Boulder. And, you know, there's been a lot of that in the sea. So, yeah, there's definitely some some flowers and silver lining that's coming through this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
if you have the time to not be worried about money or think too far ahead of the future, I think that there's some great, you know, self-reflecting and just, you know, some stuff you can get internally gifts being alone. I haven't been alone in the house for eight weeks, I think ever in my life. And so uh, <laughs> I've had a few panic attacks, you know, but, uh, but I did I'm, have yeah. some, I did have some, yeah. yeah. That's some anxiety. <laughs> but um, I guess, you know, just wanted to talk pretty much about like coming from New Jersey and going into the city in your early days, going back to the beginning and coming down to, I imagine it would be the village or somewhere like, what was that like for you when you first started to go into to New York and what was happening and what inspired you then? I was always, it was always like Mecca to me, you know, and, and uh, I don't mean that, I guess it's in a religious sense, you know, I felt that this, this was the place for me and uh, I wanted to be a beatnik and uh, always, I always wore black to school, you know, um, much to uh, my parents' uh, chagrin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's sort of how it went. I started taking the bus into the city when I was in eighth grade and, um, you know, just just walking around and uh, getting, you know, getting it. And uh, so, uh, you know, when I, when I was ready to, to move in, when I was old enough to uh, leave and, you know, move into the city, that's what I did. And uh, it was a great period then. It was uh, the early mid-60s, and there was music everywhere, and uh, people were dressing really nicely, and, uh, you know, it, it was, all, uh, was all about free love. <laughs> <laughs> was you know thank god i mean i i'm really lucky that i got to live through these different periods of of extreme freedom and um uh you know sadly uh we've had to learn our lesson you know right yeah i'm jealous <laughs> <laughs> uh tell me about the wind in the willows i've seen the record oh, in oh, the collections that is that the first recorded album that came out that you ever did as far as making records or was there something before that uh i think there probably was some backup work that i had done but um nothing to speak of that was probably the first thing that you know actually had my name on it and um <clears throat> even then i was i was mostly singing backup right. it, was a, it was a great experience you know and i was uh again you know it's it a period when record companies were paying huge amounts of money to bands to develop and uh whether you as you said you know whether you sold uh anything and and you you know had to pay back the advance or whether you uh, completely um you know crumbled and and never sold a thing you you didn't have to pay back the advance and, and that's sort of what happened to me you know we we uh we were given lots of money for for recording for rehearsing for wardrobe um i think we played one live show and uh we did this album and the uh guy who owned the studio his name was uh brooks arthur and he was a, a great character and artie cornfeld who was one of the co-producer uh, co-producers of the Woodstock Festival was our music producer um, for the first album. So uh, it was a smaller world in a sense, you know. But uh, you know, everybody felt that it was very big. Right. Well, at the time, that was everything, I guess. Yeah. Artie Cornfield. Maybe I saw the name on the record, or it sounds like a character in Spinal Tap. You know, like the Paul Schaefer character. So, but uh, yeah. so what label was uh, Wind in the Willows on? Jesus, I'm embarrassed. I, all right, I that's all right. I'll have to <laughs> I don't on, on the Google box. So after that, um, <laughs> I don't know in this order, but you were a Playboy Bunny and worked at Max's also as a waitress. And that's all pre-Stilettos, which would be the next band you would do with Chris Stein and, and Elda Stiletto. And, and that's yeah, kind, yeah. Of, kind of pre-punk uh, type of stuff, would you say? Would you, what, the Stilettos you, or... You, is Stilettos that, was, uh, <clears throat> I don't know what, I, I think it was, it was very punk in its own way because it, we were all just uh, developing and, you know, we were stupidly courageous, I suppose, you know, we were pr pretty tacky and pretty horrible, but um, it was also kind of wonderful and uh, um, there really weren't a lot of girls doing stuff. There were 
very few of us. And um, one of my favorite acts, and in a way we were just an act, you know, we were three girls. One was R&B, I was sort of rock, and Elda was very campy and kitschy, and she at the time was living with Hollywood Lawn. So, um, you know, we were a variety act in a way. And uh, But one of the other shows that I really always went to see was, um, God, what were they called? Uh, Savage Voodoo Nuns or something like that. It was Gorilla Rose and Tomato Duplante and Fayette. And uh, she, her character's name was Babs the Stunt Girl. And it was hilarious. It was one of the best things. And, and that was at CB's, you know, that all of this stuff sort of happened to CBGB's. And um, I think some of it actually even at Mercer Arts Center. Right. Well, Stilettos had like this girl group thing that I, you know, the things I've heard, I feel like that kind of went over into Blondie in, in such yeah. a great way. Yeah. And so did Chris join the Stilettos, Chris Stein, or was he in there from the beginning? How did that uh, come about? Well, we sort of had a floating... Uh, Matt Cat's Bowen. Oh, shit. It's Matt Cat's Bowen. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Should I answer? Why not? Might be somebody cool. Fun. Interesting. Hello? Hey Matt, I'm on the I'm on Zoom with uh, with Jesse. You want to say hello? <laughs> say hello. Hey Matt, how you doing? <laughs> okay, talk to you later. Okay, bye. Um, well, uh, what was the question? We were just talking, I guess, about the lineup and, and Chris. Chris. Oh right, right, right. With Chris for the band, yeah. We, we had a floating, uh, you know, uh, membership. You know, we started with the, who do we start with? We had this drummer named Tot, who um, always wore Egyptian eye makeup and um, like the eye of Ortis uh, on his face, you know, constantly. And he was our drummer. And then we had people floating in and out. And um, gee, I, I think some of the, the Miamis were playing for us for a while. You know, it was a, never really a set band. We would, you know, have a bunch of rehearsals. But the curious thing that um, I really uh, learned so much from was uh, we had a director. And um, he was um, fond of the method, method acting. So he would demand that we uh, do our songs as if we were method actors. And uh, I really learned a lot from that. That was a great, great, uh, great training and torture as well. But, you know, wow. I guess you yeah, have to cool. have a little. Yeah, you got to really, if you're going to hurt yourself, you got to really hurt yourself on stage. I guess Ricky was a method actor then. <laughs> <laughs> was he? Well, he certainly was a method dancer. You know. so, <laughs> so Blondie starts and you had already played CBGB's then with the stiletto. So that's not a new place for when Blondie's playing there. You're already familiar with that and, and Hilly Crystal and, and what was going on down there. And, uh, you know, for me, I read about the magazines and saw the photos in rock scene and, you know, slowly got into the records. But it felt like it was a scene of people that were really connected and, and had, you know, hung out together and, and that, that it was a small, like kind of a family, like a community, like, you know, you want everything to be. And uh, meeting the Ramones, I, when I look back and I listen to those records, I feel like Blondie and the Ramones, there's a sense of humor, there's a sense of nostalgia of 50s and 60s, but there's, it seems like you guys might have been kindred spirits with just the kind of things you wrote about and sung about, had, had that tongue-in-cheek thing as well, and morbid sometimes, I don't know. Did you find that when you connected with those guys when you were there? Absolutely, you know, I, I loved what they were, what they were talking about, and uh, you know, that there was, you know, this idea, I mean, it was all about being sort of sick, sickness, you know, kind of weird um, take on the, you know, the perversity and the, the sort of nasty sort of, I don't know, of society. It was really talking about, you know, and, and we still do. I mean, that's sort of the history of rock. It's always, you know, looking and saying the, you know, sort of backward sensibilities of human beings, you know, and, and how they get so hung up and so serious and, um, you know, that it, it really is, there is humor in it, but it, it also, um, 
you know, is, a, is a, can be a big drag in your life. I, I think that that is a constant in, in what we do. There's always a, always a certain amount of satire. Right. I mean, you know that. Yeah, well, it's appreciated, <laughs> you know. And I think that, you know, just jumping in, going from being Wind in the Willows, working in these clubs, hanging out, and going from, if you look at that Wind in the Willows record, or wherever, where your hair is darker and you become a blonde, was there something that changed when you changed your hair to, and you died? <laughs> To make it, did you feel like some other kind of power, like that this was some part of destiny that you're that would you, when you changed your look to that, did it feel like that, or it was just yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, it was a showbiz thing for me because I knew I had been bleaching my hair for a long time, and I was working in a in a uh, hair cutting place in Jersey for a while, and uh, it was was owned by a friend of mine from high school. And, uh, you know, I went blonde a couple of times. I had all different colors and, uh, you know, much the same as, as people do today, uh, or girls in particular, but, you know, everybody does it. Um, so, you know, it was not a new thing for me to be blonde, but it, I, you know, suddenly realized, you know, I, it was an accident, really. I was working in the salon. I was commuting, reverse commuting. I lived on Thompson Street in, in, uh, in Soho. Um, and then, you know, I would drive to Jersey and I would work in the salon and then I would come home. And one day I came home and I was a blonde and I was walking across Houston Street to go to Chris's house, uh, Chris's apartment on first and first. And, uh, I had the blonde hair it was bright. It was new. And, uh, I, ca- I got a lot of street noise. Hey, blondie. Hey, blondie. I thought, oh, damn, there, there's a name, <laughs> you know, cause we were trying to find a name for the band. So that, well, that was that. Perfect. It's yeah, uh, a lot of folks, like idiotic, right? I mean, how no, it's great. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think that's great. I remember though, you know, when I was a kid, getting into you guys, it, and the records were blowing up. You know, there were those badges. Blondie is a group, and yeah, yeah, but that was so great that you know this female fronted, but it was a band, and the writing collaborations that existed on the records, and the, and you know, and Clem being such a big part of the force and visually, yes, combination yeah. like it had something for the kids like me that want to see a guy going wild, you know, on the drums, yeah somebody beautiful but also that wasn't taking herself so serious that had an edge and I always felt that you know the energy I got from you is that you could be this female person that gave women power and energy and and a pioneer at that but also be one of the guys and be in a gang and be in a band so the blondie is a group thing you know we'd wear that in Queens before we were hanging out in the city and you know people just say oh yeah I like her blondie and not realize that that it was a group and but people also thought Jethro Tull was a person and Leonard Skinner was a guy you know people outside always got it wrong you know so but um, I want to go back to CBGB's just because it's so legendary and people, you know, look at the photos and read the stuff and the shirt is out there. But maybe if there's some way you could describe something about it or a time or a night or just something to give a, a memory or a picture of, of that, that time in your life, because, you know, it's pretty special to even us as outsiders on it. Well, it was, the, you know... <clears throat> It was a time when the the economy really was bad, so um, I think the probably the rent was more affordable then. And uh, when we started going there, it was a, a biker bar, you know, it was a Hell's Angels bar, and it was also some of the uh, Bowery guys, you know, the guys, you know, that drank uh, what was it, Night Train and stuff like that. Um, they would go in and when they when they were a little flush and had some money. But there was the flop house, you know, right upstairs. I think it was the Prince, maybe. The palace. The Palace, okay. And the Prince was down the block. Yeah, because they, they, they all had these fabulous names. <laughs> and um, so the Palace was right upstairs. Anyway, you know, it was, because it was affordable, you know, it was a, it was a place that lasted a long time. And as soon as the uh, rent became unaffordable, uh, which is, is the name of, or this the study of Western uh, culture, Western, Western rents anyway, um, you know, it, it, it ended. So uh, fortunately, you know, we, we came in at a time when uh, things were still kind of cheap and, and uh, the city was bankrupt. So uh, we had a good scene. We had a good run. And uh, I think it's amazing that you do what you do and you know, have these uh, great, great hangs, great clubs dedicated to uh, to rock music, which is is difficult in itself, and uh, yet, 
you know, you're still doing it. You're still around. Yeah, it's not easy. And right now, that's part of why I started this is to raise awareness and funds to help out the clubs. But the club started for me is just to have a place where we could, you know, have some Frank Sinatra fantasy or some, you know, pretend maxes. We felt like we missed everything. My generation, you know, I came around in the early 80s. Uh, we went to audition at CBGB's and they said, you missed it already. That all happened. And so we felt kind of lost till we walked further East Avenue A and found groups like the Bad Brains and the Stimulators and False Prophets. And my band, Heart Attack, was my team band. We started to play at after hours clubs like A7, which is now the Niagara Bar, which I'm involved in. But yeah. We started with Degeneration, my old group. You know, we try to, with, with the Green Door parties, create a New York that we felt we missed. We felt that after Reagan, it was the war on drugs and the war on sex and, and just that there was a freedom and a decadence and we wanted to get people to come and dance to records you didn't hear on the radio and also make the kind of band that, you know, that we'd want to be going to see if we were around. So, so that was where, where that group and, and I guess during the 90s, I opened that Coney place, Coney Island High, and I didn't know what I was doing. I had a record deal and I went on the road and Giuliani was mayor, like I was saying, they closed us for dancing. And I got a little smarter about it. And, you know, you can hire good people. I mean, um, Michael Sticker, who just had a birthday, he was working on the road with me for many years, but then he didn't want to tour so much anymore. So these are the people you trust. I brought him in to run, you know, the club or, or Diane Gentile, who had been my manager, um, you know, as my solo career. Then she ran the club Barry Electric. And so you, you can find places for your friends and people that you trust, you know, and that, that's important too. And, uh, of course, to have these clubs where bands can play. I don't know what's going to happen now with distancing and 25% occupancy, and who knows when we'll even be able to open. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a prayer I have that I know we'll be back, you know, and, and it's needed, but who knows how and when, but it will be. Yeah. Well, there, there's a flow to it all. And, and I mean, making, <clears throat> making your audience uh, part of the, uh, you know, the interaction, you know, is like, uh, you know, having – having people come in and, and say, you know, here I am, I made it, I'm in the club. And, you know, then they, they stand online to get in, they come in, they're doc documented that they were there, there's music playing and, you know, they have a drink and then they leave and then uh, other people come in. I mean, there's that kind of an interactive kind of dance, you know, that, that, that could go on. Because I mean, basically, you know, everything, you know, you look back and there's a great silver lining and everything was so great, but it's the same old, you know, it's the same old stuff and it, it's people, it's about the people and, you know, you know, dragging yourself out. Uh, I mean, Glenn O'Brien said it really well. He said, you know, having a nightlife is like having another job and, you know, everybody, you know, everybody does have jobs. Everybody has things that they do during the day and then, you know, they make this thing happen at night and that's, what is uh, you know it's about cities but it it is a great thing about new york city and it's been going on it's been going on forever it's been going on forever and, and it won't stop i think it's just going to keep on going and what i've admired about you is you seem to really always support these scenes you know I, we don't know each other that well but i remember the first time i met you was at a place called heartbreak yeah and we were just in our the 20s we were kids and it was a party for a night on earth the jim jarmish film Oh, yeah. We were so excited to meet Debbie Harry. And you said you were really excited because you just met Jenna Rollins or you were going to meet Jenna Rollins, one of my favorite yeah. actors. Yeah, yeah. But um, you were really nice to us. But then over time, I would see you at, you know, Jackie 60 and at, uh, you know, other clubs, the Motherfucker Party and Don Hills. And, and now, of course, you know, you come to these spots. But it's always been something that I thought, wow, this woman, you know, has been around the world, been through it all, had all the success and still likes to come out and hang out with people and people that are unique and freaks. And, you know, I don't know. What, what is that that brings you to wanting to still come to clubs? What does that for you? Uh... <laughs> you don't have to answer. <laughs> no, no, I, I like it. You know, I, I like seeing, uh, you know, stylish people. I, I love it. Uh, you know, exotic or eccentric behavior um it 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 uh i feel free you know i feel free in that and those kinds of atmospheres uh, i feel self-conscious in uh other kinds of places uh, this is you know this is where i should be that's it yeah i like that that's great yeah well, i'm gonna jump into the story a little bit because uh i don't know so you guys get your first record deal Right. First album. And was that like something you were like, hey, I can't believe this is happening? Or you were confident you knew that this was the progression? Or was it something that was was a huge surprise? Which... 
Well, yeah, no, I mean, we that's what we wanted. We were the low men on the totem pole uh, at that time. The Blondie band wasn't considered very, you know, very highly. Um, we, we took it. I always felt it was a roll of the dice, you know, that you took a chance. And uh, we weren't holding out for any kind of special uh, deal or recognition. We got offered a deal to do a single um, with uh, Richard Goddard and... Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. and so we did, you know, it was, a, it, we took the chance. We also, before, before that, we did a, a rough uh, recording with Alan Betrock, who was a, a rock critic and writer and, um, you know, really loved the, the New York scene. So, you know, for us, it was always, well, it's better to do something than to do nothing and wait for this, you know, big momentous thing. You know, we just, had to do something and, and so we did it and uh it was really like throwing the dice and um you know i i i don't know i guess i would encourage people to you know follow follow these you know wacky ideas and uh i i don't know nowadays it's it's a lot different and thank god you know for the internet you know you can do you can do really well you can uh reach out and um it's it's a great it's a great opening up yeah so when you were doing those first two records there on private stock i think was the label uh, uh i think we started out with <laughs> instant records oh, okay <laughs> instant. and then at that point then you <laughs> were with iggy pop with david bowie on keyboards and uh would be the idiot tour would that be the yeah tour? yeah 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 and yeah. was that the first tour that Blondie did, like getting out of New York outside of clubs? Getting yeah, that was a big deal. That was a big wow. deal. Was there something you learned that you remember, like you learned from that tour that stuck with you? Probably a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Besides Bowie's penis or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't bad either. <laughs> In the book, I just was like rereading the book last night. You know? <laughs> Like the part where said, I know. <laughs> I have to. I'm joking. But the funny thing is, is that you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Webb, you know, just um, unfortunately passed. But uh, his store, I want more. Um, we did a thing, me and Iggy, where we pressed our hands and feet into cement for for Jimmy in, inside the store, and. Um, <laughs> I had the original tour shirt that was so rotted, you know, was just sort of hanging together. I, I had a pin in a few places. It was like a front and a back. I must have been sweating a lot, you know, because it completely rotted. And uh, I brought it with me to get to Jimmy. And um, I Iggy uh, said, he says, well, listen, I know you never saw mine, so I'm going to draw one on the shirt. <laughs> so great. this is my penis so he drew a penis on the shirt uh, and um uh, unfortunately or fortunately i gave the shirt to jimmy um so anyway that that was a cute story cute follow-up yeah that seemed like a great night i was away on the road with all you guys at i need more down there i know yeah, that meant yeah. the world to him yeah rest in peace jimmy webb yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I guess maybe that was the Bowie tour initiation or welcoming to the tour. Maybe did that with everybody. I'll show you my penis. Hello. Start the tour. <laughs> and, you know, all kinds of stuff went on. I guess, you know, nobody cared about the scene. There was no money in it, no money involved in the, in the club and, and what was going on. Everybody was sort of scuffling and, and trying to launch themselves. So it wasn't so precious, you know, and there was, um, I, I guess you call it aberrant behavior. <laughs> maybe maybe so um after that you guys are on chrysalis and you make the record parallel lines and uh you know from my place as a fan a listener it feels like it's a real big jump uh sonically even the style of songs and i, I know it's produced by mike chapman who uh you know, I didn't realize I knew his work as a little kid. We used to listen to those K-Tail records and hear the sweet, hear uh, Little Willie and Fox on the Run, these great like rock and roll pop songs. And then suddenly, you know, everybody is hearing, you know, Blondie, especially like further out into the boroughs where I am and stuff. And, and this, the records are just sounding great. And there's an energy. And I remember you played this tour with Rock Pile at the Belmont Raceway and, you know, uh, yeah. crazy double bill. And, and everything starts to go. And, and I could see, you know, like, was it something intentional on your 
part as a band or is it just the things coming together with a new producer and a new label that just things just seem to surge up into this really present strong place yes well i mean we were never really ironed into uh uh you know we were i guess you know to some degree experimental within our you know within our framework and and uh we did go through different um different uh personnel um but you know we sort of embraced that and um always you know try to include everybody's taste and ideas and you know for a while that was difficult to make that you know clear or to make it reasonable or i don't know it, it was something that that had to develop and um it, i think it's a, a little bit different way of of working a band so um it took a little bit longer but um you know when when uh, jimmy started playing the keyboards and we developed we had that keyboard sound and then gary valentine uh stepped out and i don't know it it was uh it was, uh, I'm really, I guess, you know, I'm really, I have, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, I was really lucky. You, did you ever see the ad that we put in for, for the drummer? I uh, might have seen it uh, somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's going back before when, when you were looking for Clem. So look yeah. For yeah. Well, he was, it was a good story because uh, we put in this ad, uh, Freak, Freak Energy Drummer. And uh, we actually put the band's name, and so we had uh, 50 people show up, and we auditioned 50 guys, and Clem was number 50. And I'm serious, he was number 50. He was the last guy. He came in, and he could actually play, because a lot of guys showed up, and they really couldn't play. They could sort of play, but Clem could actually really play. When you put those ads out in the Village Voice, I did that for years in dry periods and you just had a people walked in the door. I wish I could have filmed all that, like the characters and they'd have some, they'd be, have some story. And, and you knew when they walked in the door that it wasn't gonna work before they played. And you wish you could save the, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes of trying to be nice and just go, thank you, you know, but we would go through like, all right, we'll play the three songs over again. And they, like, you knew that this person was gonna make it. But wasn't a story, didn't Clem like audition for Patti Smith that week or at that time too? Was there some connect there? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> but anyway, back to Parallel Lines. There's something urgent about it. I mean, you just put that record on, the way it starts, it's like you guys mean business and everything about that record, the sound, the songwriting, the, just the playing. And then you got Heart of Glass, which um, I guess when I was on Chrysalis, they gave us all these legacy box sets in the 90s with, with my band and we took them all and listened to them, of course. The Blondie one was the one we didn't sell on St. Mark's Place at the record store. Thank we you. That one. But <laughs> we sold all the Jethro Tull and everything, but at Barry Manilow or whatever. But um, <laughs> we uh, heard the disco song, you know, the early Heart of Glass, the, the origination of it. And it was very different. And then the song becomes this sound. And, and just the way your voice is captured, a, a friend of mine's dad, who's this older man in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, said, you know, he saw you and he heard the voice, said, this is what I want to hear being played when I die, you know, and, and it really had that <laughs> the image of your, your beauty and the sound of your voice. It was like this sensual thing, yet it was still rock and roll and had that dark side. But then the song is everywhere. What was that like for you and, and Chris and the band, like, and everybody like, was it weird just hearing this thing that's growing and it's, it's being played so often on the radio? Was that? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, but that's what we all gamble for. And right? that's what we all go for. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. Oh, that's oh. that wild. So everybody who's, I mean, Chris has said this from the beginning that anybody who joins a rock band envisions themselves as, you know, conquering the world and becoming a massive mega star and, you know, recording and doing all this stuff. So, I mean, uh, it, it's a given, it's already planted in your brain that, you know, that's what's supposed to happen. So, um, but the thing that you don't realize is how much fucking work it is to actually make it happen yeah. along with, you know, all of the, you know, um, the merchant merchandising or the mercantile mercantile end of it. So, um, but, you know, that's, that's what you, you know, you sign on for really. Yeah. 
And then the next record, you know, Eat to the Beat, which I listen to all the time, it's the sound of it. I love the openness. It really sounds like a band in a room. And, you know, it just, it, it just, you could really feel the air being pushed through the drums and the guitars. And again, it starts out with Dreaming. And uh, recently, uh, I don't know if you heard it, but Green Day did a cover of Dreaming. Yeah, yeah. Really do a great version. I was bummed because on these shows, I was going to play Dreaming tonight. I was working it up as like every guest I have, I figured, you know, I'll do one of their songs. And then I heard the Green Day one. And I was like, I don't know. I don't want to seem like I'm jumping on the bandwagon. But that record and the videos, I feel like you guys were always steps ahead and brave, you know, to embrace disco when people were saying disco sucks, to play reggae before Bob Marley was a big star, you know, and, and, and hip hop and all that. And, and the record, Eat to the Beat, just has that. And there's that, that sadness. I love songs like, like Shayla has, you don't have to say words, you just do those O's and it says so much and it, it, it states a lot. Uh, what, what's like your writing process? Do you have one that, you know, do you start with lyrics or melody? I don't even know if you play an instrument. I never asked her that. So I, no, I wish that I did, but I don't. Um, I mean, your voice is obviously an instrument, but I mean, how do you go about like when you're working on a song? There's a variety of things. I, I uh, you know, I don't know. You put yourself in writing mode or you, you know, sort of collect ideas. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much what I do. And then um, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, when I first started, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about writing songs. I, um, but it came to a point when I felt like I had to. And um, uh, I think Elda was, was a great influence in that respect. You know, she, she wrote this great song called uh, Wednesday Panties. <laughs> and uh, it's fabulous. It's a great song. And it starts out, Monday, Pink Monday. Tuesday blue, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, what happened to you? And, uh, you know, the song, I mean, how long ago did we do that song? It just stuck in my head, you know, sh and then I said, oh, okay. So she lost her underpants in some guy's pickup truck. And, you know, that's, that's how that goes. And, so, you know, it sort of became, you know, obvious to me that, you know, whatever, whatever life I had, whatever, you know, reason I had, you know, was, was writable. And that, so that's how it sort of started for me. And um, I used to write a lot in the laundry, you know, in the laundromat because of the, the machines, all that machine stuff going, all these different counter rhythms and sounds and you know, it, it somehow that really inspired me. And so that, that's sort of how I started. And and then the other thing was uh, Tar Beach, you know, up on the roof. And, um, you know, I, I'd get up really early and go up on the, on the roof. And that was sort of inspiring because it was, you know, this, I don't know, um, you know, this sort of, breathless kind of uh, beauty and and all of that you know the density of the city so uh that was that was pretty pretty good for me i i guess you just sort of have to find your um environment the environment for me played a played a lot had a lot to do with it and uh you know everybody must have a different uh, sense of that you know what whatever gets them yeah I always love this song called Susie and Jeffrey. It's a B-side. I don't know if it's an E to the beat B-side. Maybe it is. Uh, you and Chris wrote it, but it, it's got this haunting kind of, it doesn't resolve like the ending doesn't have the last chorus. It just, they drove their car, he drove his car into the wall. And there was a line about, it's not like Gordon Avenue. And I always wondered what that was, if that was from a film or some reference I didn't get. You know, there's Orson Welles in that song and some other Gordon things. Avenue, I think that you'd have to ask Chris about that, Gordon Avenue. I don't know what that was. Might have been uh, where it happened, you know, might have been Gordon Avenue. Um, but those two, they showed up years later, you know. They showed up years later and said, uh, I think that they actually got married. But they were fighting in the car, and that's why they drove into the wall. Yeah, yeah it's great. 
it's like really dark and fucked up in that great 50s kind of way where it's romance and a car crash and you know we couldn't believe that it happened you know they took out some of some of the uh the brickwork and uh they didn't they didn't get hurt i don't think the car the car wasn't total but i don't know if they could actually drive away in the car but you know i mean how often does that happen when you're in the studio recording that somebody drives into the wall and uh you know they they have they have a story to tell so yeah um lucky for us it's like a 70s movie it's like free being the bean or something but yeah. I, I love that photo that bob gruen took of you in front of uh the car that's flipped over and it's in the wreck and then he puts the guitar cases in it actually you guys look like you're crawling out of the wreckage it's pretty great yeah, that was good that well, was a good a few, more, a few more questions but but thank you for for being on the, the fine art of self-distancing live from the bunker basement of the Berlin nightclub. And uh, I got a few more bits. So um, I guess just, you know, being a woman and, and being in, in that kind of, you know, man's world. You know, I once saw a photo of you a while back, maybe in the 80s, with Susie Sue and Polystyrene, who I love, and Exine, and, and all these women in a photo. And, and it was just, I, maybe it was for a book or an English magazine, I don't remember. But it just really stuck to me, like how, like, you know, rock had always been this guy's thing. And I really think that you've been this person to, to be a strong woman, a singer, a writer, but then also have the sense of humor and then still be, and, and this is, you know, whatever, be one of these iconic, like, images, like a Marilyn Monroe of all time. Like, there's photos of you, there's people wear the shirts, there's, there's it's just, there's so many things that, that happen and and how does that feel? Are you able to take that in and and get that like how you, just on a visual level? Forget even the music, which is so strong. How you've impacted people? Like, is that something you feel? Is it weird? Well, you know, I, I you know I have to be a you know a realist. There is a certain amount of magic to it, and I was able to, you know, capitalize on the at that time. You know, it was uh, an anomaly. It was a little bit strange. Uh, and not, not, you know, as common as it is now. Um, uh, you know, but it, it, things just sort of fell together. You know, Chris was, uh, you know, and is still a, a very talented photographer. And, you know, uh, I actually knew that I was getting a lot of, you know, there was a lot of pictures of me floating around, getting in the press. And, you know, nobody, nobody knew who I was or who we were. and. Um, Actually, I don't know how this happened, but uh, we were in L.A., and it wasn't because we were playing out there at, at the time. I think it was a little bit early on, but um, I went to, I, I got an invitation to go to the Grammys, and um, I was standing in the doorway, and you know how they have the, you know, all the, the paparazzi and everything like that, and, and uh <laughs> They started taking my picture and, you know, they're all flashing, flashing, flashing like mad. And then one of them sort of says to the other, who is that? And then they said, oh, I don't know. And then they suddenly all realized that they didn't know who I was and I, I was actually nobody. And they all sort of, you know, stopped taking my picture all sort of at the same time, which was great. Um, but that was the day that I, uh, I bumped into Ella Fitzgerald. And uh, that's all that matters. You know, that's all that matters. Yeah. Is there a favorite photo or a couple photos that you think of that you really love from all the years? That's probably a hard question, but. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I really like the, there's a couple of pictures that Chris took and I really feel that they're, um, one of them was on top of Radio City. And um, there was a studio that was where we recorded uh, the first two albums. Plaza Sound, I think is the Yeah, first. Plaza. And um, so we were out on the roof. We had, had so much uh, liberty up there, you know, to go in different areas of the building, which nowadays uh, you really can't. Um, so, you know, he took this one picture of me and, and I really love it there. Um, for some reason, uh, we were good on balconies, you know. <laughs> we did good pictures on balconies. It's like Shakespeare's. Yeah. 
so one of my things I always think about is, you know, having this partnership in a band being, you know, when I'm in a group, it's everything for me. And then to have relationships outside, it, it sometimes can be a relief because you're in the band all the time. And, but then I imagine from being a fan and watching other people work together in groups like Raging Slab or The Cramps or, you know, X, that there's a strength to having that thing in it. And with somebody that you're involved with romantically, but also creatively and professionally in that thing. And then I don't, I always, always thought, what if this goes south, like so many things do in time? And how do you, you know, what, how has it been to be able to go from that place? I know in the early 80s, Chris got sick. And, you know, I'd always heard stories about, like you, people would say, well, she was going to go on Broadway and do all this. And then she decides to just take care of this guy. And obviously, your soulmates and, and love each other for, for life. But to go through those changes and then have a dynamic and be in a band and you're the godmother to his kids and is you know is there anything you could say on that how what there might be some secret tips on how to make that transition because i think it's wonderful you know when i see you guys together i don't know i i, I think about that you know why and, and how it all happened and i i just uh i don't really have an answer i can tell you how it happened but um you know, it was just, I was following my feelings. Um, I don't think I was completely rational all the time. You know, I, I think that uh, um, I, I, I'm not as career minded or business minded as a lot of people. And, and uh, I wish that I was, but um, what can I say? You know, we are who we are. I think if you, you know, <sighs> know you know how you can uh, del deliver the best part of you um or the part that you m feel most comfortable with that's the that's the main part of the battle and um that goes for you know men and women um you know I, I i know that you feel that way i know that you write that way i know that you perform that way and that's that really surprised me about you because some of your songs your lyrics are very serious and you know very you know heartfelt but um you know your relationship to the audience is is actually um light-hearted and and fun you know i mean um you you can get serious but uh i've you know i've seen you in performance and you you have a balance and so the the i guess that's the idea that's what i'm trying to say is that you have to find this balance and but my comfort zone has to meet my, you know, ambitious uh, ideas. And, you know, I mean, obviously I am, you know, reasonably ambitious, but my comfort zone is, you know, sort of, as I said, you know, when I first came to New York, I wanted to be a beatnik. And so, you know, that's that. Oh, that's a good answer. Last couple bits. Favorite solo record of yours? Is there one? Oh, yeah, I do. I really like Necessary Evil that I recorded with Barb Morrison and, and Charlie. Um, and that, that I really am proud of that. I love the I love everything about it. Um, I think that, you know, we were we had limited uh, production, you know, available and uh, we had a very small budget. But I, I think that, you know, it, it's really I love I love the things that are in there. And um movies you did a bunch of movies cronenberg david cronenberg john wars is there a film that you're most proud of your acting? i think three i'm i'm proud of three i'm i'm very proud of hairspray um very proud of um union city which was you know the first one and um and cronenberg you know video drum i i feel very fortunate i got to work with these uh you know um iconoclastic directors and writers and uh so again for me you know it, it i i greatly admire you know anybody who you know has a career and 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 acting and film and um more and more so you know i <laughs> a reason i was sort of i'm a little bit behind because you know sometimes i i rebel and don't want to watch the films that everybody's talking about and, Nah, fuck! I'm not gonna listen. I'm not gonna watch that. So, recently I watched Joker, and I am just smitten, smitten 
with Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, yeah. just incredible. The acting that he did in that movie, just, just perfect. I don't know, there's a certain amount of perfection in there. Yeah. And I love the nods to The King of Comedy, which is one of my favorite films, the Scorsese film, and that De Niro's actually in it. And it's like that whole like King of Comedy. The King of Comedy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? How do you make a joke? I talk, I, I think about the worst things that happened to me and, and. That's Rupert Pupkin. Yeah. That's yeah. It. Telling his life story. And it was so, if you listen to those jokes, they're really sad. Yeah. Uh, favorite Blondie song or songs that you love to sing still? Is there something that, you know, when it comes on the set list, you're happy that's it's there? Um, uh, Fade Away and Radiate, I think is quite beautiful. Wow. That's a good, I'm happy to hear that answer. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. And then movies, last bit with that. Movies, is there a couple films or one film like from all time that's like really inspired you as Deb? Oh, well, well probably something from Fellini. Um, I mean, it, there's so many. It's That's really hard to, to nail down, you know? Yeah. That's but I, I know that, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Surrealism, you know, was always one of my favorite uh, visions, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think I'm out of all the things I can think of right now at this moment. Now I can <laughs> ask you, Jesse. I can yeah, ask you. Another hour. Uh, <laughs> this is the Fine Art of self Distancing. We're going to be here next Saturday again, live from New York. And uh, it also goes through We Are Here, which is a network set up by Linda Perry and some of her friends. That's been really cool. And uh, portions of these proceeds, if you donate, go to help the club, especially Berlin. We hope to be back open soon. And uh, I don't know. I love you, Debbie. Thank you for doing this. It's really uh, Yeah, Jesse, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, carry on regardless. Just carry on. Yeah, we will. Like, okay. What is that Winston Churchill thing? If you're going through hell, <laughs> going. <laughs> All right. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.